I'm on a radio talk show, charging away, and oh, I'm on an NPR National Public Radio National Show, like you have here. You're, you're very fine. Um, uh, you know, this, the Irish radio is great. They always call me. They always call me uh, in America, and I respect them for that. Although I don't always cooperate. <laughs> that's, that's that's the way it goes. And so, um, I uh, a woman calls up on this. She said, I have a child that was in the unit that did all this bad stuff, and nobody will talk to me. I tried to call the government. They won't talk to me. And there's all sorts of problems. I went to the New York Times. Nobody returns the phone call. So I just sit on the air. One of those things you just do. I said, got a pencil? Think of people listening to talk radio, radio in the afternoon, aren't sitting there at a typewriter or a computer. And I gave her my phone number. And sure enough, I got that, that many crane calls. There were a lot of calls, people wanting my number. But of course, nobody gave it out. In the various stations, this was on uh, all over the American network for NPR, National Public Radio. And a couple of days later, she called me and I scoot up to where she is, somewhere in Northeast America. And, and she is a, interestingly enough, um, a very devout Catholic who supported the war totally. She had a child. There was a child involved. I'm going to fudge. But it's just fudging, just for the sake of fudging. I, don't, I could say everything, but it wouldn't matter here. But I just do it. So there was a child involved who had been in the unit that was doing the horrible stuff and had come home early. They sent the unit home early, maybe not, I don't know. And the child, after the, before the stories came out, nobody knew anything. She's in a unit, the child comes home, she's in the Army Reserve, and she's in a military police unit. She's basically a part of a group. And this is lower middle class America, and what the child was doing was getting extra money, maybe for a hairdo or to go to beauty school or what. Not that they're not as bright as anybody else, but they were totally disadvantaged of people in this particular unit. They came from rural West Virginia, Virginia area. And a good, um, one of the people with the thumbs up and thumbs down was the night manager of a pizza parlor. They were all reservists called to active duty for the war. And initially were directing traffic in Baghdad. And they were reassigned, given a couple weeks training, and sent to this most sophisticated, complicated prison, Abu Ghraib, which had incredible stigma. It was the torture prison for Saddam, which we kept for some reason, only, you know, Dumb, dumber than dumb. And, and so she'd come home early. The mother couldn't figure out what was going on. A changed person. She'd been married before she left. She came home, left her husband, left the family, stopped talking, moved to another house, and was inconsolable. Just completely in severe black depression, really. That wasn't a word that she would use. But she just disappeared, moved, had a different job. And so I show up, and which, here's the story. Um, Nobody knew what was going on. She came back about a month and a half before the stories broke about her unit. It was her unit that she had been in. And, and this woman took a, a newspaper. When the first stories came out, it was huge. The pictures of the guy in the mask and, you know, standing up in the chair. And she went to knock on the door and the daughter answered the door and slammed it when she showed her the pictures. This is it. This is what happened. So then she tried to talk to people in the government. Nobody would talk to her. And she went to the media and nobody talked to her because here's what she did. All the kids in combat duty in Iraq, all of, I'm sure the British uh, soldiers too, I don't know if Irish soldiers were there, I don't think so. The British soldiers all, one of the things, because Iraq is so unfun, no R&R, &R, everybody brings a DVD player. They all, man, even the poorest of the family manage to glom onto something so they can watch movies and play war games in the off time. And that's what they do. Everybody had a DVD player. And when the child came home, Right away, before all this stuff broke, before she began acting out, she left the computer. And it was at this point, the woman said, she decided to look at the computer. I told her, I, I tease her a lot about the unconscious and Freud. She says, actually not. She needed another computer for her office. It had nothing to do with anything. I don't believe it. I think she wanted to see what was in the computer. She opened up the computer and began deleting files. She was going to take it to her office. She was a salesperson. Began deleting files. And there was a file marked Iraq. And she hits this button and outpours 80 pictures of... A naked man standing in front of, of uh, prison bars, hand behind his head. You, you remember this photograph. Two Belgian shepherds. Bark, we call them wrongly German shepherds. Which in New York, I got 7,000 letters, I'm sure. Um, um, two Belgian shepherds, three feet away, snarling at him, foaming, you know, ready to go. And we published the one photograph of the man standing there, not even protecting his private parts. He has to keep his hand behind his head. I'm sure some of you remember it. It was just a famous photograph. But the, here's what the sequence was. In the sequence, the dogs were let loose at him. And he was bitten in a terrible place. And there was blood all over. And they ended with some hand trying to sew, hand sew the stitches. No doctor, just one of the people, some soldier trying to sew it up. And it was, un, the, the New York position is, you can't, 
it's not whether about protecting anybody, it's how much can he humiliate the Arab. And the army's been beaten to death already in this story. It's not a question of protecting. We only ran the one photograph. And it was just a nightmare. So she wanted me to have this. And so we worked out a deal. It was very complicated because I had to get permission from the child. And I also had to somehow convey to the mother, this kid needed to be treated immediately. She was in a suicidal depression. I could, I would gather. I'm not, comp I'm not competent to say that. But I knew that I had great leverage on her. I needed the child's permission to publish the picture. And by depicting, anyway, it's just the ethical issues were really interesting in a funny way. And some people do worry about it. I worry about, I had such a power position in terms of, we ended up doing the right thing. We got permission from her and we got her, I'm sure she got her into some sort of immediate treatment because she was really at the edge. So we became friends, I and this woman, because she was an amazing, amazing gutsy lady. She had a, there had been a divorce and she had a boyfriend that didn't want to do any of this and she was sort of, she just did the right thing. She was just, the morality was great. Year go by. I'm giving a speech somewhere in the area and I take her for dinner and she tells me this story that she said she hadn't told me. She said that when the kid came back, moved away, a beautiful child, she said, left her husband, every weekend she began to get tattooed and she would get bigger and bigger and larger tattoos. Eventually, all her body was tattooed up to the neck. It was, she said again, quote unquote, as if she was trying to change her skin. So. What I posit is this, as bad as it is, and I'm not even talking about the incredible destruction to Iraqi society and the chaos and deaths and the psychological damage of young children living the last six years, not only having to put up with Saddam, but having to put up with us for the last three, four years of whatever, whatever insanity we do. Um, we in America are going to really be paid back for all of this. We have about a million and a half troops circulating through there. And I'm telling you right now, some of you know what Ambien is. It's two or three ambient for the kids to get to the night, many of them. We are going to pay dearly. So we haven't begun to see, let alone World War III macro in the micro level, it's going to be devastating. And it's just, so you just sit here and it's just an overwhelming sadness and we can wait, we can count, but he's going to be president until Jan you know, on January 20, 2009. And until then, I'm not, I'm not breathing easily.